Hello everyone, thanks for joining us. My name is Katrina Schweikert. I'm an application specialist and I'm here with my colleague David McKittrick. Thank you Katrina and thank you all for taking the time to watch our little video here. Um, today we're very excited because we're going to be introducing, as you can see on the screen, the very new Pixels to Points tool. This was introduced just last week as part of the update to the LiDAR module. This is version 19 of the LiDAR module which was uh, available, made available last week, includes this Pixels to Points tool. This is a tool that allows you to generate a photogrammetric point cloud from images. Uh, we've had a lot of discussion uh, already with some of our customers about this functionality. We're very excited to be able to introduce this to you today. Before we begin, just a quick overview of some of the topics we're going to be covering today. Um, there may be those of you for whom this discipline is, is fairly new. Maybe you've just got into the UAV market. You're starting to collect some imagery. So from a non-technical perspective, it might be worthwhile just very briefly talking about the process of photogrammetry. What is involved in photogrammetry and, and how does that generate a 3D point cloud? We will then um, load up Global Mapper, the latest build of Global Mapper with the LiDAR module enabled, and we will take a look at initially the raw material that we're going to be working with. We have to uh, send out a word of thanks to our Brazilian reseller, Laurent Martin, and uh, one of his clients, Fabricio Pondian, has provided us with a sample of some point cloud data, that, or some images, I should say, that we're going to be using today. So as you can see, a little snapshot on the left side of my screen, some of the, the uh, point cloud that we're going to hopefully generate through the process uh, uh, we'll show you today. So again, a word of thanks to, to the uh, folks providing this data for us. So we'll take a look at his picture points as a preview. We'll, we'll look at, I think there's 190 new, 192 points, and we'll actually load them in as, as clickable picture points. Um, I'm gonna hand over to Katrina to walk through a lot of the parts of the uh, pixels to point dialog box itself, some of the uh, components in there, some of the settings that are available. We'll look at uh, options and settings that will be applied. We'll look at another option for generating an ortho image, essentially a geographically precise representation of a top-down view based on the point cloud, based on essentially um, gridding that point cloud based on RGB values. We will talk about ground control, um, the, the need for ground control, whether you do need ground control, um, what is in involved in adding ground control, basically improving the precision of your both vertical and horizontal accuracy in the point cloud generation process, and we'll, we'll show you that part of the dialog box. And then we'll generate a point cloud. And I have to say, in all honesty, because this process is uh, fairly processor intensive and we typically deal with very large files, that the actual procedure is going to take way longer than we have time for today. So we're going to, what I very often describe as take the cooking show approach, where we'll show you the process of generating it. We will then take a finished version out of the oven and, and show you that end result. So while we will go through the motions of generating the point cloud, we'll actually not take the time to look at that pr procedure. Yeah, so it is worth noting that this tool, um, depending on your input data and your machine, um, obviously can take a while to process. There is a dialog that's showing you the estimated time, um, and it will actually check to make sure that you have enough memory to process what you're asking of it and make some recommendations if you don't. Um, we do also have different system requirements to run this tool um, compared to the regular version of the application. Uh, so if you are looking at using this, um, it might be worth checking out and making sure that your system uh, does meet those specs. Um, notable would be it does require a 64-bit operating system. Uh, and so some of those older older computers um, aren't, aren't going to be able to process this tool, and it definitely requires um, you know, decent CPU and, and memory. Yeah, and I think yeah. the more you can get your hands on, the better. I think the higher end hardware that we're seeing coming out today is certainly going to be optimized for this type of application. And just for the record, I'm uh, what I was able to, to generate this point cloud in is simply my, my normal laptop. It took uh, uh, several hours to process, and we'll get to that a little bit later. We'll talk about how that, how that process works. Um, it is also worth noting, you talked about system requirements. If you want those details, they are on our website. They're also in the help documentation that Katrina mm -hmm. has spent a lot of time putting together for this particular tool. So if you, and if you want to see those details and also want some more information about the workflow itself, uh, go into the help files and you'll see all this information there. So we're off on a little tangent here. Let's go back to our agenda. Generating the point cloud, obviously establishing that, those 3D points. 
Time permitting, I don't want to spend too long on this because we've done this in other presentations, but we want to actually apply this data in a more realistic context. So we will go through a process of identifying ground points. The, the points that we generate are essentially raw X, Y, Z points, it's similar to LiDAR, but not LiDAR. Um, we can apply certain intelligence to them using some of the tools in the uh, LiDAR module, for instance, identification of ground points within our complete point array. And we'll show you that dialog box and go through that process as a step towards generating a DTM, a digital terrain model. So we'll generate a, a surface model, and I think we may even throw up some contours or something just to show how that process would work. And we will wrap up today by actually looking at a simulated version of the original drone flight, because when we look at the individual images in Global Mapper, we're able to pull out the timestamp and elevation and various other parameters pertaining to each image. And looking at those as a collection, we can actually essentially connect the dots and create a, a 3D flight path. And using our fly through visualization tool, we can actually simulate the flight that that drone would have took after we generate the point cloud. Obviously that makes a lot more sense. So we'll finish up our presentation today by taking a look at that visualization. So here's just a quick snapshot of what we're going to be looking at today. Uh, you can see right in the center of my screen, uh, obviously an area that we've had some activity. This is a, a landfill. And we have, as you'll see in a second, um, some drone collected images covering this area. So I like most of the projects I work on, I like to throw up some reference imagery. Even though there's no relevance, the imagery has no relevance in the context of actually what we're doing today, it's always useful to see, uh, again, that context. So this is just base map imagery loaded from one of our online data sources? It was the right? world imagery server, yeah. right, right, from our online data services. So if you want to do something similar, if you have the, the raw drone data and you want something as a background, uh, pop in the connect uh, the online data dialog box. Um, if you're somewhere other than the US, you might want to look at the uh, world imagery. Within the US, we also have the national map data, which is a little bit higher resolution. So either one of those two sources will give you a background image. And in this case, I saved it as a local file. So it took maybe 15 minutes to output that file as a, a JPEG 2000 file. So again, just a s initial visual context. What I'm going to do next is load up the individual images themselves. Now, there's 192 individual images, and I'm just simply going to display them right here on the screen. From off screen, I'm simply dragging and dropping right onto the map view. You'll see my cursor here, a little plus sign. When I release, it initiates the process of, of displaying the location at which each of those individual images was taken. Now, this is useful for a lot for a couple of reasons. First of all, I find it useful if I'm initiating a, a process to a, to uh, analyze a particular area. I want to make sure if I've got coverage. Do I have enough images? Is there enough spacing between? Do I have gaps in my data? This will give you that initial visualization. In fact, we had one guy. Uh, this is going back a, a few months. Talked about buffering these image points to to kind of analyze kind of coverage area. Perhaps a little bit of a raw analysis, but these are essentially vector points simply displayed on the map. Um, the info tool in the toolbar gives us the opportunity to, to preview any of these pictures. So simply select one of the picture points and based on whatever your default image viewing application is, I use Irfan View as you can see, it will simply display it. And you can see it even at this level, it's a fairly detailed image. Um, we're displaying this at about 21% of actual size. So it's very high resolution. You'll see some more of those details in just a second. Uh, the other thing that we can look at here is the individual parameters for each file. Um, these are, as you can see, listed as individual layers in the overlay control center. But just taking a sample, we can look at the metadata. It gives us the uh, location information here at the high level, the uh, coordinate information. Um, we can also see, and this will depend on the specific format, what it's able to pull from either the EXIF data or some of the other metadata that comes with that image file. So here you can see for this one particular file, a few other pieces of information. Now this is not necessary for what we're going to be doing today, but it's also always useful information if you're trying to analyze the quality of the images. So we will be focusing on images that are collected from UAV data, but you will note that these are loading just as any other picture point would. Um, so really, these are just images taken with a camera that includes that geotagging information. So you could go out with your cell phone and basically take a photograph, and it would load Te into Google Mapper the same could. way. Yep. So you mean yep. I can go fly around in, uh, in my little bat <laughs> So obviously, we are, you know, planar mappers. Um, UAV collected data is going to get you the best coverage. Exactly, but, um, exactly. There is no hard requirement on having a drone to process this tool. It is also worth noting that what I've just done here is not necessary. I wanted to load these, these images initially just to get a preview, 
But as you'll see in a second, when we actually load the pixels to point dialog box, you can load them right into that dialog box. So this is just by way of introduction. It also gives me the opportunity to talk briefly about how this process works. What are we going to initiate here? Um, as you can see, there's a fairly dense coverage of images. And as we look at an individual image, as I did before, you can see quite a large area of the ground is covered here. Now, if I load up, if you just note here, this little collection pond over to the left side or the right side of my screen here, if I load up the, an adjacent photo, you'll see that same feature is now displayed in that photo from a slightly different perspective. And I'm going to try another one just to verify that this is actually true. If I load this one, oh, we're looking in a different direction. Sorry, let's try maybe this guy over here. There we go. You can see again, exactly the same asset, but from multiple different perspectives. Now, this is in essence what photogrammetry requires. And the best way to compare this is to consider how your eyes work. Um, if you were to cover one eye and look off in the distance, you lose that depth perception. But two eyes essentially gives you a very localized stereo view. And photogrammetry is essentially based on the same principle, where you're looking at an object from two or more uh, vantage points and being able to gen generate or essentially triangulate your brain triangulates to give you that level of depth perception. Now photogrammetry is essentially a process of mathematizing that or giving that values, actually uh, deriving uh, values that tell you how far that asset is away or that feature is away. So quite literally what we're going to be doing in this process or what Global Mapper will be doing is identifying recognizable features in this uh, in multiple images and determining where they are in three-dimensional space based on that type of analysis. So again, you can go to school and get four years of photogrammetry. <laughs> That's a very, very untechnical uh, two or three minute explanation as to the, the principles behind photogrammetry. Yeah, and I will mention as well that um with this tool, we are looking at many images from many perspectives. Um, we are having it automatically calculate some of those parameters that are necessary. Um, so this isn't going to work with two single stereo pair images. Um, you do need many, and we also recommend, um, you know, ideally at least 60% overlap in your coverage. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, good point. And that, we could verify that even our visual uh, checking here, we can see that that was the case. We saw that collection pond in multiple images. So. So this is the latest build of Global Mapper. This is version 19. In fact, I have a an even more recent build than that was that was released last week. This is uh, you can see the date here for those who haven't seen Global Mapper. This actually represents the the actual date this was built. Now we're sitting here on the fifth uh, of December, December fifth. So this is yesterday's build. Um, if you downloaded version 19 from our website, there are going to be subtle differences to what you see and what I see. One, for instance, is when I point to the new tool that's available. Um, it says pixels to point tool in my build. I think in early builds it did not say pixels to point. And quite literally that's because we were still trying to figure out what to call this tool in Global Mapper. So we came up with this a pixels to pull fairly recent pixels to two points tool fairly recently. And uh, so that's why that's been added. And it will be continually updated and we will be releasing new versions as we add additional functionality and improve the uh, some of the performance. Now, for those who haven't seen Global Mapper, again, we're not going to go into the details of the application. Obviously, we're targeting very specifically our pixels to point functionality. It is a full app like GIS application. We've got other presentations on our website that go into details of some of the vector tools, some of the raster processing tools, and certainly some of the terrain analysis functionality um, as well. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on the peripheral components obviously we're focusing just on this one new tool it is part of our lidar module again lidar module is an optional add-on to the software the toolbar you see uh, underneath my cursor is a visual representation of what the lidar brings to play things like ground identification which we actually will be looking at a little bit later feature extraction lidar qc for uh, basically off our um, assigning uh, a point cloud to vertical control to allow you to adjust it vertically you could actually perform that process uh, during the workflow that we're going to show you today to improve the again the vertical accuracy of your point cloud We've got manual classification tools in here as well again not going to spend time doing going into these today But we we, uh, we have covered these in previous presentations New button here for those of you who have used the lighter module is our pixels to point tool brings up the download box as you see it here um, This is where you'll initially load the images where you assign whatever settings that are required whatever output files you're required if necessary for applying control points, and even for previewing the images and removing those that are not necessary. So, number of ways we can load the files. Yeah, so the first thing that you probably want to do is load the images. Um, so we had initially loaded them as picture points, so you will see an option there to add loaded points. 
Um, so you could do it that way, including maybe selecting and just doing a subset of them. Um, but we're going to go ahead and load all of the files um, out of a directory, or you could also use the add folder to load everything inside of a folder. Um, and a little off screen here, we've just selected uh, the images that we wanted to load, just using the probably the shift key to select multiple. And these are the same images we just previewed a few minutes ago on the screen itself. Um, and again, add loaded will have achieved the same thing. Uh, you can, as you can see, uh, preview the images once again. This is an internal viewer now. We're not, not opening an external, an external viewing application. But if there is an image or a collection of images that are not relevant, maybe they, the coverage is beyond the extent of what you're interested in, or maybe they were taken during the, the launch or the descent process, they're, they're not intended for, for use, you can remove what you don't need here. So again, you've got the option of running through a preview. So we've got a couple of attributes that have populated there for each image. We can see the location as well as an elevation. Um, this is going to vary a little bit based on what your input images are, what camera collected them. Um, you might also see a relative elevation value for some imagery. Um, we also have here the camera information. Um, that can be important. A little part of the processing here is um, you know, understanding the parameters of that camera. Um, so you do want to have that correctly identified. Yeah. And the other option here at the bottom is essentially a reverse of what we just did. If, if you load the images initially uh, into the dialog box, obviously we have no reference map visible in the background, but we now can load those onto the main map view. And actually you get an extra bonus if you do this because you'll see not only do we get those picture points again, and it's asking me if I just want those that are selected or all of the images. I want all of the images. Um, you will see that it will actually connect the dots and that linear feature, that line feature, represents the flight path of the camera, of the drone. So obviously this was the first image that was collected. Oops, off screen. Uh, sorry, I think it selected the line itself, but this uh, is the first image that was, was selected. There we go. And um, you can detect, if this was a, maybe a lower altitude image, maybe you may want to discard this one, but now you can see the progression of the flight. And it's an interesting flight path here. It kind of doubles back on itself a little bit, does crisscross in a fairly regular pattern. So again, that's what we're seeing on the screen behind simply by loading the images to the main map. And these uh, input image files are going to order based on those timestamps. Um, so that should be the way that the flight path is generated yep. as well. So if you go down them sequentially, you should see in order as the flight path, flight path progressed. So we have um, a couple of options here in terms of the output that we want to generate. Um, let's talk about those. Uh, sec that section first. Um, so anytime we run this tool, we're going to generate a point cloud output. Um, we have the option here to save it directly to a global mapper package file. Um, if you don't check that option, it's still going to generate a point cloud. It will load it into the current workspace. Um, but there are a lot of cases where you might want to save that directly to a file that you know where it is. Um, so that, there's that option. So if we want to turn that on, we would specify the location of that output file. And it is worth noting as well that the GMP file is obviously a proprietary format. It will only work in Global Mapper. So don't generate this file in the expectation you will hand it off to somebody using a third party application. It's really intended, or it is intended only for Global Mapper users. But it is very efficiently compressed. So if you're looking for a file format to archive your data, uh, GMP is certainly a, a good choice for consumption within Global Mapper or for distribution to another Global Mapper user. That would certainly be your, your format of choice. Um, so again, define the path, define the layer name, um, and that will output that file. Uh, next option here is to generate an ortho image. And once again, it's a GMP file that will be created, a Global Mapper package file. The ortho image is essentially a gridded version of the point cloud where the gridding is derived from the RGB values, not from the elevation. So it essentially stitches them together and creates a solid surface, um, giving you a geographically precise top-down view. Uh, of, uh, of your point cloud in a single raster image format. Now we'll take a look at that output when we finish the process and see what uh, it, it, it gives you essentially the points represent almost like pixels. Um, you have options for resampling as you'll see and for determining the resolution based on uh, the point spacing or a given unit of measure. So if you want to be very specific on the resolution of the output ortho image, you can make those uh, specifications right here. Yep, so just like when you're creating um, you know, a surface model from the point cloud, um, that is the actual output resolution of those pixels. Um, and that default value of filtering um, is to just remove a little bit of the noise in the data. Um, it will do some extra kind of box averaging to 
um, just reduce a little bit of the noise, especially at the edge of some of the objects that might be above the yeah, ground. Yeah, you'll see, you'll see that, especially with this type of point cloud. Um, going, going back to the output, and I uh, can't mention this in passing, but it is worth noting, if we opt not to see the GMP file, we get the point cloud rendered inside Global Mapper. Um, you have the option at that stage to save the workspace. The workspace at, in that context will actually embed the point cloud in the file itself. Probably one of the largest workspaces you'll ever save because the, each point will be essentially part of that workspace file. So don't feel that you have to save a GMP file. You can save it internally. Uh, close down Global Mapper with that workspace saved. Come back in the next day and you'll pop up the workspace. The points will still be there. So while we say it's generating internally, you have the option of saving a workspace. But this gives you a, an external file. The GMP is an external file. Um, the last option here is to save the log information and the statistics to an output file. Um, so this is actually going to display as the tool is running, um, but the option here would actually write that to a text file that you could reference again. We're going to bypass the ground control section for now. We'll revisit that uh, in, a, in just a little bit and come to some of the options. And the first option here. Um, and you'll see the box is checked in my, in my case, is to reduce the image size. Um, you have the option to essentially take the original images and by whatever factor you've entered here, reduce the original size. Now, obviously, the benefit of that is going to be faster um, and it's going to require less memory. So you're basically your input data is going to be much, much smaller than the original. And for this example, and um, you'll see the output when we're finished with this, we're going to use a factor of four. So basically, these extremely large files will be a quarter of their size for our purposes. Um, when you initiate this process, what's going to happen is Global Mapper is going to take these images and write them into a temp file. Yes. And that temp file will basically have a version of the original image that's reduced by the factor that you've determined here. Now, when I first tried to process this point cloud, I said, well, well, I'm just going to go with a one to one. I'll see it at full resolution. And simply because I'm using my everyday off the shelf laptop, Global Mapper actually warned me that I don't have enough memory. I have 12 gig of memory on this machine, so it's not certainly a high end machine by any stretch. And it actually recommended what the optimal image size would be, image factor would be in my case. So it actually is intelligent enough to know how much to reduce it by. So, um, well, Kat, I don't know if you want to explain a little bit about the consequences of the reduced image yeah, size. Yeah, so you are um, down sampling the input images. Um, but I will say that this is the best way to speed up the processing time. Um, and you are not getting a fourth of the number of points as your final output. So you, you are reducing the number of input pixels that it has to process and try to match. Um, and that greatly increases the speed. But you still will get a dense point cloud. So the exact factor in reduction in the final point cloud is much less than the number yeah, that you I are setting. You are I slightly reducing the size of the point cloud and greatly increasing the processing the process speed. Process. If yeah. speed is important, this is certainly something you should definitely pay attention to. And just by putting that in context, I tried this with one of the early data sets we were, were, were testing with, and I, I went from one to two, and there was only a matter of a couple of hundred points difference between yeah. the size yeah. of the two point clouds, so yeah. Yeah, so you can still get a nice dense point cloud even by using um, a decent amount of, of downsampling of your images. Okay. Another option is to use a relative altitude based on what you define as the ground height. Now, Global, uh, Global Mapper, the process, as you can see, the, the basis of this process is derived from the known elevation of the UAV itself, um, which will do its best to determine the ground elevation. But you can be more precise if you happen to know what that base ground elevation is. You can simply check that box. Enter that value, and that will be used as a ground elevation basis. Yeah, so um, with UAV data collection, um, obviously you've got a some kind of collection device up in the air. Um, the horizontal accuracy is usually what you would expect from a GPS, um, you know, within a reasonable range. Um, the vertical height is a lot harder to do with GPS because we don't have, we're not picking up on satellites on the other side that would let us know exactly yeah, how so we on are the horizon, they above, tend to be overhead, right. yeah. yeah, so we're kind of, we don't have quite enough perspective there to get a good height based on those numbers. Um, some of the uh, hardware that people are using do have other ways to get that height value. Um, so this is a little bit hardware dependent what you're getting for your elevation data. Um, but this is a nice way to just override all of that information and say, your ground starting point from your collection is whatever height you specify. So you're basically shifting the entire point cloud 
to say that the starting point is some um, maybe survey at elevation. Yeah, relative to everything else will be relative to that, based on the same process, but it's based on a defined base level. Um, I think we may have no noted this earlier, but I think it's worth noting as well. In terms, we're talking about horizontal accuracy here, and we will talk about ground control in just a second. But even as a post process, there are a couple of tools in Global Mapper that you can employ to offset the embedded elevation in any point cloud. One is a, a tool that will allow you to offset it by a specific amount. Um, it's our alter elevations function. So if you know they're all off by exactly a meter, you can subtract a meter and it will basically recalculate the elevations uh, based on whatever you define. But we also, as I mentioned previously, have our, our LiDAR QC tool, which is a button in the toolbar, which allows you to establish uh, an offset based on, on surveyed ground control as well. So a couple of post-processing options is that you can apply uh, or, again, if, as Kat mentioned, if you wanted to define that relative altitude at the start of the process, you can do that. And we get to analysis method. We'll pass this one over to Kat as well. So we have um, two different methods that you can employ for um, analyzing these input images. Um, and the kind of the basic choice here is between an incremental method and a global method. Um, so to explain this a little bit, let's take a look at a couple of images here. Um, so say we have some feature that we've identified in these first two images, um, maybe something like the pond that you were showing. Um, in the incremental method, you would start with those two images and identify all the matching features that it has found and then incrementally add the third image and the fourth image and the fifth image to try to um, locate that in 3D space with the least amount of residuals. Um, so it's going to kind of incrementally look at the images. The global method is going to look at all of the images at once and using all of that information create a 3D point for whatever that feature is that it's trying to locate. Um, so this varies a little bit the recommendation based on your input data. Um, the global method does tend to be a little bit faster um, but it is recommended for data that has higher overlap. Um, so you don't want to use it if you've got maybe only 40% overlap. You probably want to go with the incremental method. Um, in a lot of other cases, incremental does work best. Um, the one thing that it can do is the, uh, the residual, the error in your X and Y can kind of increase as you move away from the starting point. So that it's not necessarily even error. So if you're seeing that um, in your output, you might want to try running it in the global method as well. Um, but in a lot of cases, the incremental is going to work well, kind of starting from where you started your flight and then progressively following. And there's, there's no hard and fast rules here. I think it may come down to if, if you have, uh, you know, if you're in, in intending to embark on a process where you're collecting multiple sites, it might be a good idea to use one of those sites as a test case and try both different methods, see what you think will, will work better, and then you can assume that that would work best in all your... Yeah, and that's another case where um, even if you did want a really high resolution final result, you could set or reduce image size and kind of generate a preview output. Right. So, so if you greatly increase it, try the two methods, and then maybe run it at the full resolution after that. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So yeah, moving down a couple more settings here. Quality, uh, normal is default. We have a high resolution output. Again, based on our tests, we're finding that normal is probably adequate for most users. Yeah, in, in most cases, um, there's not a, a great difference in this. Um, there, there are a few minor differences where it's using a little bit higher resolution um, on the high setting. Uh, but we found the normal setting in most cases almost as good, so we, di we did choose that as the default. Okay, and then the final thing is a camera type. And this is obviously is going to pertain to whatever camera that you've been using. You'll see a default here is a pinhole radial 3. Um, but if you have some reason to adjust this based on the, the type of camera that you've been using, for instance, a fisheye lens, which obviously give you a much uh, higher level of distortion in the image, wider uh, field of view, but more distortion, you can specify those op options as well. Yeah, so to simplify this, for most users, you really don't need to adjust the right. setting. Um, it's just trying to understand, we've got this planar image, it's trying to figure out how much warping there is in it. So mm -hmm. unless you have a fisheye camera, or you know that um, you know there's a lot of maybe warping inside of the actual image the way that it was collected, the default should work fine for this one. Yeah, so, so that's basically all the settings. And, and again, based on your requirements, whether you need the ortho image, whether you, whether you want to output a GMP file, you can make those settings. Um, a little hesitant to do this now because we don't have uh, several hours to sit around. Um, but you know, in a few minutes, we're going to click the Run button, and it will initiate the process. We'll take a look at the dialog box initially and walk through some of the initial screens that you'll be seeing. Um, you will notice an option to save and load from file. We're actually going to do this a little bit later with some um, a pre-formatted version of this with some pre-existing ground control. So saving the file will basically take 
uh, the data path to do your images and all of the settings you apply here and allow you to export that and then obviously load that in again if necessary. It's good for, um, as you'll see in a second, I've actually recorded some ground control and it'll save them in there. So with my fingers crossed, and again, we will not be looking at the full uh, three hours or so processing. We'll go ahead and hit the run button. Uh, it's requiring me to save a GMP. I'm just going to type in the word test here because I had specified that. That's fine. It's going to save it right in my default folder here. And again, we'll click the run button and you'll see the process initiating. And what it's doing first is it's copying over the original images of which there are 192, copying them into your temp directory. And then we'll see some more of the uh, uh, processing information displayed when that, that's completed. Yeah, so this is a case where um, I know a lot of tools we, we definitely recommend putting the data directly onto your machine. Um, in this case, it does have to copy all the images into a specific folder anyway. So if you're pulling off of a, you know, a network location or an external drive, um, you don't necessarily need to move them locally. First yeah, it it for does that tool. once as a one yeah. time and then everything is processed internally on your, on your local drive. So. So that 1547, it's, it's currently, well, I just finished, I guess. But uh, so you'll see the, uh, the estimated finish time, 1957. Now we're looking at about uh, just before four o'clock in the afternoon. So it's already calculated that this is gonna take uh, about four hours to complete. So again, needless to say, we're not gonna hold you for, for that length of time. Um, but this is just, you can see the process has started, it's loaded the images, and it's going through and analyzing them. So here we are, we've aged by three hours, three and a half hours, and we're seeing the final result. Um, the point cloud has been generated and is, as we mentioned, automatically displayed on the map. So um, as you can see, it's a colorized point cloud. Obviously the colors of the images have been inherited by each individual point. Um, those who haven't seen Global Mapper before, again, we'll just quickly take a look at some of the individual functions here. We're zooming in so we can see the individual points themselves. So you can see how closely spaced they are. We can take a look at the metadata for the point cloud and it will tell us that the spacing, the average spacing is just about seven centimeters. Um, that would have been slightly higher, we would assume, if we had include, um, improved or gone to a higher level detail and perhaps uh, not reduced the image size, but not significantly. Um, the density is also an important um, number here. It's about 200, just under 200 points per square meter. So mm -hmm. certainly much higher a resolution or, or density than we would typically find if we were working with traditional LIDAR data. So anything that you do with this data, any processing you do is obviously going to be reflecting that higher level of detail. Um, a couple of other things we can show very quickly. We can look at a profile. You can see there's quite a clear trench in here, I guess. Um, just using my profiling tool, I'm going to draw a cross-sectional view and we'll see off screen. I'll drag it into view. You can see that now in profile view. You can see that cross-sectional view, you know, going from about 605 meters down to 585 and going up the other side. So just a kind of another visualization that we have available in the application. And finally, we have our 3D perspective. I'll pop up the 3D view and you can see the point cloud in all its 3D glory now. You can see this originated as a series of images, just simple images, um, 192, and through the process of photogrammetry, uh, we're, oops, we're able to generate um, our point cloud. I'm not sure where my data has gone. There we go, I misclicked here. Let me bring it down into view just a little bit better. Actually, let me resize the window. There we go. So I'm looking for my home button. There we go. So we're back to where we were. So again, there's my pawn that I referenced earlier. So that's just a quick preview of the end result. Again, hit that run button and you'll end up with uh, point cloud such as you see here. So one of the things that uh, we mentioned, we, we um, said we would get back to later is ground control. Uh, I've actually loaded a pre-configured version of this dialog box in which I had identified four ground control locations. Now this is just a case of defining what those points are, adding a new point. Um, if you know the coordinates, either based on the current projection or based on your lat long values, you can simply enter them here, or you have the option to select from the map. Now this is a, a reason why it's a good idea if you're, if you're doing this based on a known area to have predefined some very specific ground control locations, even marking them out yourself before you send your, your UAV up. You can then very specifically identify them either by looking on, on a map if that's the case or 
having just surveyed them, you'll know what exactly those values are, both the X, Y, and also the Z value can be entered here, as you can see. So having done that already, having listed my ground control, um, we're now going to identify the individual images in which that ground control location appears. Now, in this case, it happens to be one of the corners of these terraces here. I didn't do it with a lot of precision. Obviously, I'm not local to this area, so I don't have access to it, but I'm going to, it's actually this little drainage feature right here, which I identified based on these coordinates. And you can see it appears in this one image. It's a case of just going down, maybe previewing the images in the top down view is a good idea to see the approximate images or the images that would you would assume would contain this feature. But what we're going to do is essentially tag that, adding that to uh, to the ground control. So you can see my cursor in the overview map now has a little crosshair and you know whatever level of detail you want. I'm just going to click in the middle of that. So that's established a correlation between those surveyed coordinates and the specific location of that feature in that image. Now, if we go to the next image, again, thankfully they are now arranged in order. So I know the, the adjacent image is likely to have the same feature. We'll actually go to the one that right after. I think it's right here in the corner. So maybe this one will work. Again, you can see right down below where I am right here, the same feature. Let's zoom in a little closer this time. And obviously this is just a, a arbitrary feature, but if you want a more, more precision, obviously maybe having the corner of this would have been a better uh, uh, survey target. But once again, simply add that point at whatever location. You're manually selecting that now, and that's your second point. So you would repeat this process for each of the images that contains that feature. Um, obviously, the flight lines went uh, in, in perpendicular flight paths. You want to make sure you include both the left, right, or east, west, and the north, south flight paths as well. So that is going to precisely dictate that that point in that image or that feature, that recognizable feature, will be defined based on a specified lat long and a specified elevation. And theoretically, if we initiate the process of generating our point cloud, assuming we did, we'd survey these points accurately, it would give us a much, much more precise final product. Um, I will add one note about the, you mentioned the projection there um, of the data. So um, if you don't load any data into your map and you process this tool and generate a point cloud, it will um, choose the appropriate UTM coordinate system. Obviously, we want to generate a point cloud that is in some kind of ground projection. Um, so we do default to UTM, or you could load data to begin with or in configuration set another local projection. Um, and whatever your um, configuration projection is, is what the point cloud will generate it and also what projection you'll have to specify those ground controls if you do use them. So you put the, yeah. whatever that local system is will be what's yeah, available. Yeah, so we could your... change that in yeah. the configuration. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So again, we're not going to proceed with this, but this is just an option to give you a higher level of precision prior to generating that point cloud. Uh, also worth mentioning that is not a requirement of processing the tool. The first one that we ran here um, was run without using ground control points. And maybe you can just zoom out a little bit here, David, and we can compare to that original base map image that we had. So depending on your use case, you may not need to use that type of um, you know, survey level precision in your location. So yeah, we'll quickly do a quick visual analysis here. Oops, sorry, wrong one. We'll turn off the point cloud and you can see you know, we're obviously in the right part of the world. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good start. Um, perhaps an easier way for me to visualize the accuracy is not to look at the point cloud, but look uh, to look at one of the derivative products. What you're seeing on the screen now is actually the ortho image. And it looks the same as the point cloud, as it should, because it was built from the same base data. We don't have points now, we have pixels. We have returned to pixels. So we went from pixels to points, back to pixels again. So this is now a geographically precise, where every pixel theoretically is correct geographically. And again, I haven't done any testing this yet, but we'll see. This is obviously a much lower base image. Let me zoom out a couple of levels here. And we'll see if we can, uh, again, use the image swipe tool might be the best function to use, pulling back the low resolution image when it decides to cooperate. And there we can see what's underneath. And you can see once again, looking at the building at the top, just off a little bit, just probably based on the fact that we didn't specify ground control, but you see it's, it's certainly close. And we have the option now, if necessary, to rectify as a post process. So if you have, again, survey points or you've, you're referencing this to some imagery, any layer in Global Mapper can be rectified. So we can take the layer, uh, we can go to the um, I almost forget we put this. Uh, rectify, thank you. I think people keep moving these things around just to confuse me. So this rectify process will allow us, allow us to override any of the inherent geographic position and define it ourselves based on re rectification points. 
Okay, let's take a look at the point cloud again. We've got a few minutes left here. And again, we might as well take a look at the, the output product of our efforts here, this point cloud. Um, this is not LiDAR. It is worth noting, we have to keep reminding ourselves, although we're working within the context of the LiDAR module, it's not LiDAR. It is simply a point cloud. The key elements of this point cloud are the fact that it's got an X, a Y, and a Z or a Z value. And that's evidenced by the fact that if I visualize this by any of the variables we have that we would typically apply to LiDAR, classification included, we don't have any classes. There's no distinction in this point cloud between what's a tree, a building, on our obstruction and ground. Now, for most of the procedures that we recommend you follow uh, when using a point cloud, you'll want to first identify ground. If you're doing extraction, you want to eliminate ground or identify ground in order to determine what's extracted, whether it be a building or a tree, etc. So ground detection is one of the key components of Global Mapper or the LiDAR module. So what we're going to do is we're going to initiate this process using our auto ground detection function. This is not new. This has been in the LiDAR module for, for many generations of the product. Basically, what we can do in here is determine uh, within the array of points which points are ground, and it will automatically classify those, and you'll see that visually on the screen when we're done. Now, a few options here to note. Um, we have the option to determine the sampling area, or the bin size, as we call it, to determine uh, where it would identify a plane surface, a ground surface. You can derive that from a multiple of the point spacing, but we've found that especially with this drone data, a physical unit works best. So I'm very specifically asking it to look for a, a 50 centimeter radius in order to determine if each point occupies the same surface as its neighbors. This is my sampling area. We can establish a threshold above or below which will assume that a point is ground. I want to keep this fairly loose for this case, but you can be much more precise if you want to very specifically isolate ground points. Um, the build maximum height delta is way beyond the range I expect, that's fine. One thing I did change in this case is my expected terrain slope. Simply by looking at the terrain in this area, especially those embankments, they're fairly steep, more steep than kind of a normal flat area. So I bumped that up to 25 in this case. And by the way, these are settings I came, came around simply by trial and error. And th these seem to have worked best. And building width is not necessary in this case. We're not dealing with an urban or built up environment. So um, by the way, if you're going through this process yourself with your own data, it's a good idea to have this box checked. So you can repeat the process with different settings to see what gives you the best results. So you don't have to reset them manually every time. This will reset your ground points to unclassified at the start. So here we can see the final outcome of that. And you can see, obviously, visually, uh, we have a different color. We have brown points. And I'm going to use my profile tool once again just to quickly draw a cross-sectional view here. And you'll see it has identified obstructions or uh, obviously features that are not ground and identified those are, are ground and colored those accordingly or classified them accordingly. Each of those have been assigned a, a ground classification. So I think there's a lot of vegetation down here. It's obviously removed those from likely ground. So here we've applied a level of intelligence to this point cloud that gives us the basis for, for generating things like a DTM or if we wanted to proceed and, and identify buildings or things like that, we now have ground points that form the basis of that process. Now the, the final kind of workflow here is to transform this into a surface, a gridded surface, essentially using our gridding tool. Um, our, basically choosing the gridding tool from the toolbar is going to give me the option to choose the layers. It's you know, obviously the only uh, relevant for the point cloud layer. Um, one of the things I want to do before I set the other settings is to make sure that I'm only going to be gridding based on the ground points that I've just created. So I'll clear all, choose ground, leave all the other filtering options as they are. And again, with the, the option to define the sample spacing. Oh, by the way, we are creating a DTM. Um, the options here are to triangulate all of the points, which is not typically recommended, especially when we have such high resolution data. Um, it's going to give you a model which will basically address the X, Y, and Z value of every point and triangulate based on those. We want to bin them, which is basically a process whereby you can determine within a defined area your min, max, or average, depending on what's relevant. For my workflow, the DTM, the terrain model, bare earth model, I want to look for the minimum within a very specific area. I'm going to keep this a fairly low resolution process just so we can see the results fairly quickly. So I'm going to dumb it down to about a one meter resolution model. Obviously, with a high uh, higher resolution data with the option of creating a very, very precise model. Um, some of the other options here to determining what to determine uh, how close to each individual point to analyze. In other words, if there are gaps in the data, such as you see here and maybe here, if we leave this as a tight um, uh, process, it will leave those gaps in your data. There'll be null areas. 
moving it towards loose will actually fill those in. So it's a relative scale. We'll leave that right where it is. Everything else should be fine here. We'll click OK. And as an output, we should see a surface model generated. And we'll go ahead and turn off our point cloud when this uh, fills in. And you can see now we have a terrain model. This is a, now a raster a 3D terrain model uh, that was generated from those points. And once again, we'll pop up our 3D view um, and see that in our 3D perspective. So again, I dumbed it down just a little bit to a one meter resolution, but you can quite clearly see where these terraces are that we noted in the, uh, in the original point cloud. And you can see those now represented in the three dimensional surface model. Now, had we an extra hour, maybe two hours, probably even three hours now, we could start to describe some of the other processes that Global Mapper offers uh, with this as the base data. Uh, things like contour generation, volume calculation, uh, um, cut and fill analysis, but even watershed or, or viewshed analysis. Some of those, any of those tools are available to you now uh, after you have this uh, three dimensional model created. Now, the final thing I'm going to do is turn on the ortho image here. And hopefully it will sit right on top. I may have to adjust my ordering. I'll bring it down to the bottom. And here we have the combination of the procedures that we performed, the identification of ground, generation of a terrain surface, combined with the initial ortho rectified image. And again, now if we look at that in a 3D view, it gives us a very realistic perspective of the terrain. And again, it's resampling as I'm moving around here, so it may be a little take a little time to fill in. So we've loaded back up the point cloud here. Um, another tool that is easily available to here is generating a fly through video. So this might be useful for playing back the flight. Um, maybe you know if you're doing some QA or um, even as a final product presentation. Um, so when we did create um, or when we loaded those initial images into the uh, pixels to points tool, um, we were able to load them into the main map and that did generate that flight path based on the timestamps. Um, and we are actually able to play that back. So um, I've got the flight path here and I'm just going to select yeah, actually, it. Actually, sorry, can you put the feature info to it? I just want to take a look just to verify. And this is actually very interesting. Again, this was just a line that was generated internally. Using the feature info tool, maybe you haven't seen this, even those of, those of you who have used Global Mapper, we have the option to look at the individual vertices. And you'll see for this particular data, we have embedded the elevation, the length, uh, total length, the time. Um, this data was <laughs> obviously the calibration of the clock was not correct on the, on the collection process, 2018, but that's okay. We're not time travelers. As more importantly, speed, average speed and heading are noted here. So these are actually embedded in, this, in the line. And this is what forms the basis of the flight line itself. The, uh, the fact that Global Mapper not kind of play it back based on that information. Sorry, Kat, I just interrupted you just a little bit there. So those same attributes should be available um, in the fly through tool as well. So if we click the fly through button, we're seeing the um, these are the keyframes in that image that is going to generate that um, data. We could modify these if we wanted to kind of change the direction it's looking or the pitch. Yeah, one thing I did actually adjust the pitch on these. You'll see it's the pitch, which typically would be straight ahead. The assumption being it's looking straight in the direction of travel. I angled it down so we can actually simulate what the drone would see. So, yeah. so let's go ahead and pull up the 3D view here. And um, we are defaulting to not showing that flight path. Um, which is, allows us a little better view when we start playing it back. But we'll just do the quick preview button here. If you want the high resolution version of this, you do want to go ahead and save it to an output file. So this would save to a video file, but we'll just play back the preview. And choose which path we want to play. And this is going to run through and recreate kind of how that data was collected. And angled down, I'm not sure if this angle is precise, but obviously we're looking down as opposed to looking straight ahead. So uh, th th this is something you can create manually. Uh, we've talked about this in, in various presentations, but this is a very interesting application for this because this is actually using real information, real data that's embedded in each image and essentially, as I said earlier, connecting the dots. And I have a, uh, an output version of that. Um, it's about, I think, seven or eight minutes long. And just to put it in some sort of perspective, I'm just looking at my files here. It's about a gig and a half, one and a half gigabytes in size. So just to be aware that it, it, you can output this, but the files can get quite large. So 
I think I'll go ahead and stop that. So that would be an interesting way to see kind of how the data was collected. We could also modify that if we just wanted it as final product, you might want to fly through maybe lower to the ground or something like that. That is actually the height that the um, UAV was collecting at. Um, another final thing that we should mention, um, since our generated point cloud here is a Global Mapper package file. Um, you know, you might want to deliver your point cloud in some other format. So I'll just quickly mention um, some of our export options here if you're not familiar with Global Mapper. Um, we do have a lot of file format support. So if I just go to that generated point cloud and go ahead and choose to export that, all sorts of LiDAR files that we could output, including LAS, LAZ, et cetera. And, and it would embed, you have the option in that format to actually embed the RGB values that are associated with that file as well, um, as well as the other other parameters that pertain specifically to, to, uh, to LiDAR, LAS, or LAZ files. So again, we just wanted to provide a quick overview of a typical use of the new Pixels to Point tool. We're very interested in hearing from you. Um, you can download version 19 of Global Mapper from our website. Um, if you're currently a version 19 user, it will update your current build. If you're not, you can in, uh, install it. You can try it for a couple of weeks as a, a trial, an evaluation license that's available. Um, we're very interested in hearing from you about how this, this tool works, so please do get in touch. I'll give you some contact information here. Um, if you have technical questions, the folks in our technical support group, geohelp at bluemarblegeo.com, um, are the folks to get in touch with. Uh, if you're interested in licensing Global Mapper, if you're interested in what we've shown today or maybe uh, some of the other videos that we've produced uh, and you want to get a quote for some, uh, some licenses for your company, uh, orders at bluemarblegeo.com. And as I said before, if you're not currently using the software, you can go to our website, the URL is noted right here, and uh, download it directly. And I will put these links right in the description below the video. So thanks you for your help today, Kat. Thanks, David. And we'll speak to you next time.